Welcome to Friday. Everybody happy? How many people are happy it's Friday? All right. Because what looms in front of you is a long weekend that you can devote to working on assignment two, right? Um, okay, so today we're going to finish up our unit on the processor. People who are sitting way in the back, you might want to move down a little bit just because I can't promise that you'll hear me the entire time. Um, so today we're going to finish up our unit on scheduling and multiplexing the CPU with a story about Linux scheduling. So we'll actually look at a real scheduling algorithm that's proposed for Linux, and it gives us a chance to talk a little bit about Linux, about the Linux community, and about how development works on this particular large open source project. Okay? Um, we'll also do a little bit of review. On Monday, we're going to start memory. So this is the end of one of our first big units on how operating system multiplex and abstract system resources. We're going to be done with the CPU and we're going to go on to memory and that'll consume us for the better part of a month. Okay? Um, so uh, the grading for assignment zero through two, the code reading questions, should hopefully be done today. We're close. Um, you know, we front loaded a lot of this, so this is like three quarters of the human grading on the assignments that the TAs do all semester and we're trying to get it done pretty early. Right? So a lot of the questions are finished. We're wrapping up the code reading questions. The design should be done on Monday. Those obviously take a little bit longer. Okay? Um, one thing I want to point out about the design document grading is that when you receive your grades, you'll notice that the, the rubric is really designed to evaluate whether or not you've completed the portions of the design that we asked you to do. The rubric is not evaluating whether or not those portions were correct. So for example, it says, did you talk about wait and exit? You will probably get points if you talked about wait and exit, even if you said something totally crazy about how you're going to implement them, okay? Because what we're trying to get you guys to do is think about how you're going to implement them, right? So please don't take the design document marks as an indication that what you're proposing is a good idea, right? Um, if you want feedback on that, print out your design, bring it to office hours, talk about with the TAs, post it on Piazza. We just don't have really a way of delivering that kind of feedback on the designs to the website. Okay? Um, assignment due, the uh, implementation is due two weeks from today. So there's not a huge amount of time left. On Monday, I'm going to start uh, sort of presenting some of the people who have finished up assignment two. So there may be people out there who are thinking assignment two is not going to take very long. I finished assignment one in a couple hours. That's great. So prove me wrong, right? I think that most of you guys should be started right now and working hard in order to get a good assignment two together. So if you want to prove me wrong, do it this weekend. And then on Monday, I'll have you down here in front of the class and we'll all give you a big round of applause for finishing the assignment two implementation. I am betting there's not going to be anybody down here, right? Zero. Okay, so prove me wrong, right? And then you'll have two weeks to hang out and just relax. Um, okay. F as, as one final note, so please keep in mind that the academic integrity of policy is not just applied to the code that you submit in this class, it's also applied to the de design documents and particularly to the code reading questions. So just please keep that in mind as you submit them. We, we do look for and notice suspicious similarities between the answers that you are able to view once you submit the questions and the answers that you submit. So we, we do notice stuff like this. Obviously the TAs are looking at the two side by side. Okay, okay so it's, it's really funny. I have these videos up on YouTube. I have a thousand subscribers. I'm pretty proud of that. Um, of all my videos, there are 13 dislikes. 13 total, okay? I've got a lot more likes, but six of them, for whatever reason, are on the video for this lecture. I don't know why. Maybe you guys are going to find out today. I've invited people to this, and now it's going to be terrible. I am going to try to work on this verbal tick, I promise. It is now embedded in my brain. I know I do this too much. My wife knows that I do this too much. She thinks it's funny. Um, apparently, some random, this is a comment from one of my YouTube videos, uh, this one, actually. So apparently, I issue writes at the rate of one every 5.6 seconds. That seems pretty impressive. She actually asked me, she said, did you check his math? I'm like, no, of course I didn't. Why would I do that? First of all, I don't want to hear myself doing it. Second of all, it just looks pretty credible. Okay, so I will try to stop this. I know I, know I have a bad habit, right? <laughs> I need like a beep every time that happens. Like, okay. 
Um, so any questions on the scheduling algorithms we've already covered before we talk about new ones? OK, so let's do a little bit of review. So we, we talked about different types of information that schedulers might use to decide what thread runs next. What are some, people give me some examples of information that the scheduler might want to use to help it decide which thread should be able to run. One example. Yeah. Yeah, so the last time it ran, how, how much time did it run before it blocked? Because that might allow me to make better use of other system resources. Um, well, I also, so what I would love to know, right, what nobody pointed out is I would love to know what the thread's about to do. And we talked about a category of schedulers that can actually do that. We can implement them, but we can talk about them. We can pair other schedulers to them. Um, what I do instead of being able to predict the future is I use the past to predict the future. This is something that we will come back to when we talk about virtual memory, uh, and this is something that operating systems are always doing. Assume that what just happened is going to continue. So the uh, multi-level feedback queue is used doing a variant of this. And then finally, what does the user want to happen? So I have things like priorities that give me the ability to inject exogenous information into the scheduler in order to try to improve how the system behaves. So most schedulers have ways of accepting external input. They don't understand why you gave that thread or that task a particular priority, but they are willing to do your bidding. They're willing to give it more access to the CPU because you told them it was important. So we talked about some examples of schedulers, however, that don't use any information to choose what the next thread to run is. What's the simplest version of a know-nothing schedule? Random, the random scheduler. And then we also looked at round robin, which needs a little bit more information. It needs to remember what order it ran the threads in last. What about schedulers that try to do a better job? So we talked about things we might like to know. Kendra pointed out, I would really like to know, how long is it going to use the CPU next? When it blocks, I might want to know, how long is it going to block? And I also might want to know, is it going to block or yield? If it yields, remember, it actually is saying, I want to keep using the CPU. So it's not necessarily in the process of using another resource. If it blocks, it is. So if it blocks, it's great, because what I've allowed it to do is do whatever I needed to do to get another part of the system active and then get it out of the way, right? Um, so we talked about multi-level feedback queues, and this was the algorithm we used. And I, I'll just, we'll talk about this for a minute. I'll just put it up there, and then we'll talk about it because I want you guys to be thinking about this as we look at the rotating staircase scheduler today because there are some, some similarities here. So what the multi-level feedback queue algorithm is trying to do is reward interactive threads, or at least identify and reward threads that give up the CPU quickly. So if a thread runs, does a small amount of work, and then blocks, that's a thread that I want to prioritize because, again, it's put some other part of the system to use. So I choose a scheduling quantum. Remember, most of the algorithms are based on this. We'll see this again in about 20 minutes. That's the longest period of time I'm going to let a thread run before I forcibly stop it and allow another thread to use the processor. Once I have a scheduling quantum from LMLFQ, I establish some series of queues or levels. And if a thread blocks before it finishes its quantum, that thread will eventually be promoted into a higher priority queue. If the thread hits the end of its quantum and does not block, that thread will eventually end up in a lower priority queue. Any questions about MLFQ? If you don't understand MLFQ, it's going to be hard to understand RSDL. OK. So just a little bit of review. CPU-bound threads, what direction do they go? If I have a thread that's computing digits of pi, what queue is it going to end up in? Bottom, right? These go down. I.O. bound threads, they go up. OK? And, and keep this in mind, right? Because one of the inadvertent features of this type of algorithm is despite the fact that I prioritize, quote unquote, high priority, high interactive threads by allowing them to use the CPU first, they still may end up not receiving as much CPU time as lower priority threads simply because they block very quickly. And this is something, this is a problem with these type of schedulers 
that Khan Kalibas, who wrote the scheduler we're going to talk about today, noticed and tried to address in his design. So, so finally, why are we doing this work to try to identify interactive threads or threads that would give up the CPU before the end of their time quantum? Why do I want to run them first? I've said this two or three times already today, but can somebody remember? Yeah. Yeah, that's part of it. Right, it, yeah, exactly. So it allows me to keep other parts of the system busy. I have to run to use anything else on the system. If all I want to do is get to the CPU so that I can just take that character input and redraw it to the screen, and then I'm going to be sitting there waiting for you again, I might as well let that happen. Because then I've got some other resources that are kept busy, like you, and I can let the CPU bound thread run at that point. Right? OK. So any questions on the scheduling algorithms we already covered? Yeah. So can I fool the scheduler? Sure, right? I mean, you can manipulate the scheduler, but in order to do that, you have to run for very short periods of time. So for example, I guess if I was computing digits of pi, what I could do is I could just pretend to block for a couple of times, get into a high priority queue, and then start computing some digits, right? And then I would start to fall, and then I would do that over and over, right? Um, you, you, you could do that. Um, it's not clear that you're not going to get better performance than if you just do what you need to do, right? Because you're wasting time every time you block unnecessarily. But it's a good point. I mean, a lot of these algorithms are sort of based around the fact that we don't really expect threads or tasks to be malicious. We expect them to be going about their business, trying to do what they need to do. We don't expect them to be trying to game the system or take advantage of the system. That's a good question. Any other questions? Existing scheduling algorithms. OK. So, so now we're going to talk about sort of the, the semi-recent history of the Linux scheduler. And I say semi-recent because this was recent, you know, four years ago. Right? Um, but I think it's neat, because I think it's fun to know that some of you guys might think, I remember asking you guys at the beginning of the semester, how many of you do you think are going to actually hack on a real operating system? And very few people raised their hands. The fact is, there's still opportunities to hack on real operating systems, including Linux. Linux is still under development. People are still making changes to it. It's still evolving. And even something that you would think is, is basic and simple as the thread scheduler. What is a more core part of an operating system than thread scheduling? This algorithm has been rewritten several times within the last 10 years. Right? This part of the system, oh, sorry. <laughs> this part of the system continues to be developed. And so you want to jump on board even if you have a day job. The guy that wrote one of these new schedulers is not a full-time Linux hacker. He's a full-time anesthetist. Um, so I guess while he's sitting there watching people who are having operations, he's thinking about ways to improve thread scheduling. I don't know if I would want my anesthetist to be doing that, but it's probably pretty boring to be watching someone who's under anesthesia, right? They don't do much. Um, and there's some other sort of fun things that come out here too, okay? So Linux, right? How many people have a device that uses Linux? How many, for how many people is that a phone? Uh, see, how many people have an Android phone? All right, so all of you guys that have an Android phone have a device that runs Linux. Linux is everywhere. Um, Linux is a large, you know, clearly very actively maintained. These statistics are a couple years old, about 10 million lines of code. Half of that is dedicated to supporting device drivers. And this is an interesting, there's an interesting story there about how device drivers are difficult to maintain and end up being a source of a lot of problems with kernels, but we'll come back to that later in the, in the semester. Again, a few years ago, about 2,500 developers. So think about the challenges you have coordinating with your partner to do these assignments. Imagine if you had 2,500 partners for the class. So clearly there's an organizational structure that has to emerge, right? Um, new, Linux is, you know, pushing kernels, new releases frequently. Um, at the time, it was about every three months a new uh, major kernel release, and the minor ones com may come out even faster than this. Um, 
So again, I don't know anything about Linux firsthand. I have never committed a line of code to Linux. Um, but here's what I understand about how the system works. This is pretty normal. Different subsystems have maintainers. And every file within the subsystem also has a maintainer. The maintainer is the person that you contact when you think there's a problem, when you think there's a bug, when you have a problem with a particular uh, subsystem on a particular device or in a particular context. So the file maintainers are in charge of the contents of the file, and the subsystem maintainers are probably also making larger design decisions about the direction that various things should go. So for example, there's somebody in charge of maintaining the scheduling subsystem. That person is the person who says, hey, by the way, it's time to write a new scheduler. We, we don't like features of the existing one, so we're actually going to write a new one and use it to replace the code that's already there. Um, and at the top of this process, there are a couple of people who are responsible for merging in pretty much every commit. And again, this is three, you know, four years old, but I'm assuming this is still true. You've got uh, Linus and Andrew, right? Someone at the very top, and these people may be different now, but there is some person who literally is merging in patches and pull requests into the mainline Linux tree. Somebody has to make these final decisions about what gets committed. And it turns out this isn't, you know, you might think this is kind of weird for an entire kernel or operating system to just have a small number of people who are making the final decisions, but this is kind of how it works. So I did an internship once at Microsoft, and it, Microsoft OS at the time was very similar. There were three guys, I mean, there were a lot of people developing different features for Windows, but when you talked about the core OS, there were really three people who were making final decisions about things. And I remember being in a meeting once um, where we were, the people were talking about, oh, well, what, should we do this and should we do that? And this guy named Landy Wang, who was the maintainer of the virtual memory subsystem in Windows, walked in, and it was like a god had descended from Mount Olympus or something, <laughs> right? You know, when he walked in, he was like, no, we're not going to do that. And they were like, okay, you know, <laughs> you know that's, that's it, right? Like that, <laughs> like, because he was maintaining the whole thing, and if he didn't want it, it wasn't going to happen. So there was no point even continuing a conversation. Um, so again, this is not, not particularly unusual. So the top guys maintain an official mainline Linux release. Now there are also a lot of variants and forks and subtrees of Linux that you can find out there, and some of those are maintained by the individual developers themselves. So the idea is if you're a major Linux developer, you have code that you want to test out, that code goes into your own tree first. And then eventually, if it works, and if the, you know, the guys who are in charge, the people who are in charge think that it's a great idea, then finally it will migrate into the mainline kernel and be released as an official Linux release. But there are features that sit in these subtrees for long periods of time, sometimes forever. There, are, there have been popular features in Linux that for whatever reason never left a certain subtree. Maybe they were considered too experimental, maybe somebody who is in charge doesn't like them for whatever irrational reason, um, but they sit in these sort of like, like, I think there's something called an M, there's like an MM subtree. Con Calibus, who we're gonna talk about later, maintains a dash CK subtree, or did when he was working on this. Um, and keep in mind, Git, the version control system that you're using this semester, was built to, to it was built to host Linux. That was the, you know, it's, it's written by Linus, it's built to host Linux. It was built to facilitate the Linux development model um, and to address features of earlier systems that Linus did not like. Um, so, so one, uh, now you, you can imagine this is a big community and Linux runs on all sorts of different types of devices, right? Desktops, servers, phones, embedded devices. Um, and it's, it's pretty impressive that you're able to maintain a single sort of stable mainline kernel release for such a large diverse project. But there are a lot of tensions between different parts of this community. So let me give you some examples of tensions between the desktop and server people, right? So server guys, right? The server guys work with these large companies that run Linux servers. Those large companies frequently have a lot of developers. They have well-established code bases. They have benchmarks that they use to evaluate new releases. They know exactly what they want. When a new version of Linux comes out, they run their benchmark, if it slows down things a little bit, they just say, uh-uh, 
you know, we're not, we're not going to use that one, and they wait to see what happens with the next release. Um, a lot of, there are a lot of people, you know, Linux itself is an open source project, but Linux as a community has generated an enormous amount of economic activity. There's plenty of companies that package Linux who will pay you to help support Linux, et cetera. But a lot of these guys work in the server space, right? Um, and, a, and a lot of the companies that work in the server area and use Linux have people on staff who are also part of the Linux development community. So if you look at those 2,400 act people who are developing Linux, to the degree that they have jobs that are directly related to Linux, a lot of them are at these types of companies, right? Because these companies make money. They have one guy in staff who's in charge of working on the features in Linux that they need and also sort of contributes things back into the Linux ecosystem. Okay, so server Linux. Now, desktop Linux. How many people run Linux on a desktop machine? Okay, you guys are weird, right? Um, how many people run it on a laptop? That's a terrible idea. Don't do that. Um, okay, so, you know, desktop Linux. Think about it. You know, first of all, what, what are the benchmarks here? I mean, desktops run all sorts of different types of software. And so in contrast with the server guys who are frequently running a small number of applications, the desktop benchmarks are really, really less uh, well-defined. You've got users that are cheap, right? These are the people who wouldn't pony up 100 bucks for Windows. Or these are the people who got Windows for free with their new PC and then got rid of it anyway, right? Um, so yeah, these, these people are not necessarily like gonna inject a lot of money into the community, okay? Server guys, maybe. Your desktop guys, not so much. And then, you know, desktop users are frequently just normal people. Now again, Linux desktop users are not normal people, right? But desktop computer users is a subset of people that pretty much includes everybody now, okay? So they're not necessarily gonna hack on the system. They just want it to work, right? Think about somebody's grandma. She just wants to be able to open her web browser. Right? She doesn't, oh man, I'm doing it. She doesn't want to write a new interactivity benchmark. She just wants to use AOL Instant Messenger or whatever people use. Um, the, the Linux kernel maintains a mailing list. How many people have ever tried to read Linux kernel mailing list? I did this one summer for fun. Um, it's terrible, right? It's like 99% of the time you have no idea what's going on. I still think, I, you know, this was 15 years ago I tried to do this. In all the time and, and energy I've spent thinking about computer systems between then and now, I think I might have moved that number down to 98. I think if I read it now, I would not understand 98% of what's going on. It's really complicated. And the discussions that are going on in parallel about really low-level features and, and subsystems that a lot of people don't even know exist or really care about. Um, this is not where you go if you want help. Like, I can't get Firefox to open, what do I do? Uh, and sometimes people wind up there uh, who are confused. These are the kind of people who clearly need help because if you had a little bit more of a clue, you wouldn't have asked the question in that forum. You would have gone there and like, looked at one of the messages and said, no, 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 this is not where to ask this question. Um, and sometimes people can be mean. So I, I, you know, I, I looked this up and there are some of the, unfortunately, and you know, I, this, this isn't entirely intended to be funny, but some of the people in this community are, have some of the same problems that unfortunately primarily men in the tech community seem to have uh, with anger management issues, uh, using appropriate language, having some reasonable norms for how to talk about this. So this is Sarah Sharp. She's an active Linux developer and she finally got so fed up with it that she wrote this as part of a long series of angry back and forth between some of the Linux developers that was apparently prompted by a discussion that, you know, as she points out, it got a little bit out of control. We're talking about computer systems, people. There is no need to threaten anyone with physical violence. Um, uh, just, let's, just get the, let's just get the new driver to work, right? And then, um, okay. So, so let's talk about the schedule. So before Linux 2.6, and this is pretty old now, it's probably aughts, maybe, maybe late 90s, um, the 2.6 scheduler did not scale well. So one of the things, you know, we talked about schedulers and one of the things we wanted our scheduler to do was to not take very much time because the process of choosing the next thread to run is by definition not 
running the next thread, which is what I want to do. So the longer that process takes, the more cycles I'm wasting on the machine that I could have used to do actual useful work that the user would notice. The pre-2.6 Linux schedule had this terrible property where the runtime actually increased as the system had more threads. So the longer the ready queue was, the longer the scheduler would take to figure out what to do. What's kind of terrible, I mean, this isn't very good period, but why is this even worse than it might first appear. Yeah. Yeah, so that's not a property you want your system to have, where the more people are, it's a great way to put it, the more people who are waiting, the longer they have to wait. Okay, this was what was happening. So the more loaded the machine got, the more time the scheduler was wasting. The scheduler was doing its best when there wasn't a, even much of a decision to make and it just kept doing worse and worse and worse as the decision got more complicated. So this is definitely not what we want. This is the opposite of what we want. So the Linux 2.6 scheduler aimed to fix this. So the Linux 2.6 scheduler had O1 performance, which is fantastic. Constant running time regardless of the length of the run queue. The O1 scheduler combines two priorities. There's a static priority, which is set from outside the system. So this is that external information that you can tell the scheduler, here's how important I think this particular task or process is. And also computed something called a dynamic priority. And the dynamic priority goes back to this goal that schedulers have had of trying to uh, improve interactive performance. And so the dynamic priority was an attempt to boost the performance of tasks that were deemed to be interactive. Um, how this was done was a problem. So the code that was required to detect that threads were interactive got really weird and complex. There were a lot of these magic numbers and constants, and it was very hard for people to understand how it worked. And because of this, the entire scheduler was very difficult to understand. So it was hard to model the scheduler. It was hard to say, given a certain set of threads and tasks with certain behavior, how is the scheduler going to work? So this became difficult to do. And for something, again, the scheduler is a core component of the OS. Other than the page fault handling code, the scheduler may be one of the parts of the OS that runs the most often. It's running all the time. And it's something that you want to be able to understand. I want to be able to understand how it works, and I might even be able to want to model how it works. But I certainly don't want a big piece of spaghetti code that's got a bunch of nasty constants and weird math built into it. Um, and this was sort of the, what the Owen scheduler, that's the problem the Owen scheduler had. Okay. So, our, the hero of, our, of the day, Con Calivas, an Australian anesthetist, and he started to become interested in scheduling. Now, I think this is really cool. It's a guy. Just, you know, random hacker in Australia, and he decides, I'm interested in scheduling, right? You guys are learning about scheduling. Maybe some of you are now interested in scheduling. And he starts, and in particular, he starts becoming interested in scheduling for interactive workloads and systems. And this is a much harder problem than the server community. Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. Here he is. It's Conkley. This looks like a nice guy, right? Um, so I don't know if you guys can read this. I'll, I'll read it. Uh, to you parts of it. So one of the things he did when he got started was that he tried to define what he was trying to accomplish. He said there are some properties that we want of interactive user-facing systems. And at the time, not only were there not necessarily precise definitions or a precise understanding of what those properties were, but there was also a, you know, a, a very, very sort of problematic latch, uh, lack of benchmarks that would allow us to measure those properties. So he tried to address both of these problems. So here you'll see, you know, he's saying, we don't really understand what makes a nice feeling Linux desktop. We don't understand at a scheduler perspective the things that go into accomplishing that. He separates them into two things. Responsiveness, the rate at which your workloads can proceed under different load conditions, 
interactivity, the scheduling latency and jitter present in task where the user would notice a palpable deterioration under different load conditions. This is kind of like what we talked about before with responsiveness being click. Um, sorry, yeah, with responsiveness being click and interactivity being continue. So as he points out later, responsiveness allows you to continue using your machine without too much interruption to your work. That interruption would be caused by disruptions to your responsive patterns using the machine. Things that are taking too long to paint or return. Uh, you know, you imagine the characters get all weird and laggy. It makes it very difficult to type, move things around. Interactivity allows you to play audio or video with any drop, without any dropouts or drag things around, right? If some of you guys have had a system that's under load and starts to feel laggy, one of the things that you can do to experience this in all its glory is grab a window and drag that window around. And you'll see like, you know, it's, it's getting jumpy and, you know, and, and that's a way that you can measure the fact that the system is not producing good interactivity. So this is, this is nice. And I think this goes on. Well, okay, I'll get back to that later. So he wrote some benchmarks to address this. I think that's in a later quote. So in 2004, he released something that is called the Rotating Staircase Scheduler. So the Rotating Staircase Scheduler to the existing scheduler, it threw out about 500 lines of what he referred to as black magic. The interactivity detection code in the existing scheduler that was really hard to understand and difficult, made the scheduler difficult to model. And he replaced that with 200 lines of code that implement a fairly simple approach that has some nice properties we will talk about in a minute. There are some similarities to multi-level feedback. So here is his description of the scheduler. It's 01, which we want, runs in constant, the scheduler algorithm itself runs in constant time. It's scalable, no interactivity estimator, that was one of the nasty pieces of black magic. No sleep run measurements. So you'll see there's nowhere where I'm having to measure how long a particular task spends sleeping or running and then use that into some, as an input into some weird algorithm. Um, the design has a strict enough design and accounting that task behavior can be modeled and maximum scheduling latencies can be predicted and we'll come back to this in a minute. So I can actually guarantee that a certain task will have a chance to run within a certain interval. That's really important for, for con con continuous tasks, right? Because they want to be able to make sure that they run every certain amount of time in order to do something like paint the screen or write audio to the sound buffer. So there's a link on the website to the full description, which is pretty cool to read. And here's my attempt at it. So, there's one parameter is the round robin interval. That's how long the, I'm trying to remember, I think that's how long each task is going to run. So this is the sort of maximum, maximum uh, length of time any task will run at a particular level. And I can also input a priority. So like many other schedulers, this allows me to input a priority. Now, a prior, what a priority does in the rotating staircase scheduler is it defines the levels or stairs at which the task is allowed to run. A high priority task has more opportunities to run because as you'll see what happens is it starts at a higher level and if it runs out of time at that level, it has an opportunity to run at a lower level and at the lower level and lower level and lower level. So if I start at the very top of the staircase, I can potentially fall all the way down and run at every level all the way down to the lowest level. So that's what defines priority. I have more chances to run during each scheduling epoch. Sorry, some, <laughs> one of my graduate students finally committed me that, convinced me I'm saying that word wrong. So it's epic, I guess, and every scheduling epic. I like to say epoch, it sounds like something from Star Wars. Um, if I'm a lower priority task, I start at the bottom, and so I have fewer chances to run. And, and this will become clear in a minute when we go through an example. And, and so tasks can run at most a fixed amount of time per level. So every task has a quantum that it's allowed to use. And if I'm a high priority task, I'm allowed to use it at the higher, highest priority level. And then that quantum gets reset if I run out and I'm allowed to use it at lower uh, levels as well. If there's time, we'll sh I'll show you how this works in a minute. 
Now there's also a, a quant there's also a limit on the amount of time that the scheduler can run in any level. And what this means is that regardless of the task behavior, I can predict before I run the scheduler exactly how long it will be before any task has a chance to run. This is really nice. This is bounded latency. So I can say, and we'll do this in a minute, here's the beginning of time, and within this many number of milliseconds, every task in the queue will be able to run. It's a really, really nice feature. So here's how this works. To start, so I break time into epics. To start a scheduling epic, I put all threads in the queue that's determined by their priority. Remember, the highest priority threads have more chances to run. They start in high priority queues and fall down. Then I run threads from the highest priority, highest non-empty priority queue in a round robin order. If the thread blocks or yields, it remains at that level. So if it blocks, it goes on to a waiting queue. When it returns, it will come back to the same level if the scheduling epic has not ended. If it yields, same thing. It goes back onto the end of the run queue for that epic and has another chance to run. If a thread runs out of its quota, so if it's exhausted the amount of time it's allowed to run at a particular level, then it falls down into the next level. And it will have a chance to run at that level. It ends up at the end of the run queue for that level. Finally, if the level's quota is exhausted, then I take all any threads that are still ready to run in that level, and I move all of them downwards. So, and I continue this until either all the quotas are exhausted for every level, or there's no threads that are runnable, at which point I would reset the epic and move every thread back to where it started. So let's see how this works. I have a bunch of threads, different priorities. I've colored them to represent their priority level. And I order them into these queues. So priority two in this case is my top priority. Priority zero is the bottom priority. Let's say that each one of them has a, the round robin interval is five units, five milliseconds, whatever. And what this allows me to do is assign a quota to each, to each level. So you'll see what I've done is I've decided to assign the quota of 15 to priority two. That's because there are three threads that are ready to run in priority two. Each one of them has a quota of five milliseconds. Same thing for the other levels. Now remember, if the quota for a level is exhausted, then I'm always going to move down. So how long is this scheduling epic going to last? At most, who can tell me? Yeah. No, for this particular example. Well, how many, how many time units, right? So I just add them up, right? 45 time units, that's the longest that this epic can take. It can be shorter. It's possible that it's shorter. In fact, in many cases, it will be shorter. But the longest it can take is 45 time units. This is really nice, because I know even before I start running the tasks, even before the tasks do anything, block, yield, whatever, I know exactly how long it's going to be before I reset the epic. Now, keep in mind, I also know that every thread will have a chance to run in this epic. And it will have a chance to run for at least five time units. The higher priority threads may have more chances. They may, have, they may not. But what this allows me to say is, within a 45 millisecond period, every thread that's active will have a chance to run for five milliseconds. And I can guarantee that. So this is a very nice property for the scheduling algorithm to have. So now what do I do? I start going round robin through the top queue. Let's say I run thread five. Thread five runs. It runs out of its quota. So it's exhausted its quota at priority two. What do I do with this thread or this task? Where does it go? Goes into the, pri into the back of the priority one level. Now notice here that I have not changed the quota for priority one. It's still only 20 units. So is it guaranteed that thread five will have a chance to run at that level? No, because if every thread before it uses its entire quota, then the level quota will be exhausted and I'll have to move it down into priority zero. 
So keep in mind, it's not guaranteed that threads that fall down the staircase from the highest priority will have another chance to run, but they may. Yeah? How do you find out the initial What's that? So how do you determine the initial priorities are, are determined using whatever the same external information is that another scheduler would use, right? So you might say, I want to make sure that my cron jobs run at the lowest priority and my video player runs at a higher priority. Right? So yeah, the priorities are not determined by the scheduler. There's external information that the scheduler is, is responding to. That's a good, good question. So now what do I do? What do I do next? I run thread one, and let's say thread one runs for two time units and then yields. So where do I put this thread? So it goes back on the end of the run queue. I'm running things in round robin. Now I'm gonna run thread two. Let's say thread two runs for three time units and then blocks. So that thread is not now not runnable. You could just put it off the screen somewhere or something. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but it's blocked. Now what do I do? I want thread one, and let's say thread run also blocks. So now what, now what am I going to do? I just gave it away. What thread gets to run next? Three. So this is, so I just want to point something out. This is why the priority levels tend to work. Because you'll see that despite the fact that thread priority two still has a quota left at that level, there are no threads that are ready to run at that level. And so now I go down, and uh, despite the fact that priority two has still some quota left. So this is what gives the threads that start at the top priority and, and continue to exhaust their quota, this is what gives them more chances to run. Because in many cases, I will not, uh, I will not use up all the quota at a level to run the threads that started at that level. So I'll have some left over to run threads that started at higher levels. Okay, so now I start thread three. Uh, thread three runs for a bit in blocks. I start thread eight. Thread eight runs for a unit. It also blocks. I start thread six. Thread six exhausts its quota. So where does thread six go? Goes down into priority zero. It's fallen down the staircase. I take thread nine, I run that for a unit, and let's say it blocks, and now here I am. So now I've got thread five that started in the priority two queue, exhausted its quota there, fell down, got a new quota at priority one, and now, happily, it gets to run. So its high priority is paid off. It's now had 10 time units to use. So let's say it exhausts its quota. Now it falls all the way down into priority zero. So now I'm out of threads to run at priority one. So what would happen at this point if there was a, let's say that thread one wakes up. It's whatever it did that blocked that call returns. What happens then? It would get to run again, remember? So the schedule would say, oh wait, hold on, there's something in priority two. I go back up the staircase and run that. So every time I choose a thread to run, I'm looking at the current state of things. If a thread blocks, it comes back to the same priority level that it left. So I don't necessarily always proceed in order down the staircase. Sometimes I have to jump back up to grab a thread that became runnable during the scheduling epoch. Okay, and I'll, you know, this is, this is pretty, pretty obvious what happens from here on out. Any questions about this? This is nice. I like this outcome a lot. Yeah. Right. So yes, if it's sleeping while the epochs were started, or the epochs were started, it is returned to the priority it started and given a new quota. Right. So when it comes back from sleep, it'll be put back on whatever priority queue it started. Right. So I just at the end of each epoch, I just reset everything. If the thread's not ready to run, it's not considered, but its quota is still reset and it's put back at the priority level that it started. Great question. Yeah. Any other questions about RSDL? Okay, we'll get through the, yeah. Is there a set number of levels or does it say? No, the levels are a parameter. Like they're, they're, or they're a configuration parameter for the algorithm. Uh, be the what's that? The number of levels will say the algorithm itself will become No, the, the algorithm, remember, the algorithm is, is, is 01. 
Um, and I think that's because of the data structures they use, right? All I need, algorithm needs to know is what's the queue that has the, the highest priority thread in it, right? And then I just choose that, right? So choosing this should be constant time. As long as I can maintain like a heap or some sort of data structure, so I always know what's the highest uh, priority thread that's available. Right. Yeah, it's a good question. All right. So RSDL has a bunch of nice features like we pointed out. At the beginning of every epoch, I know exactly how long it's going to be before every thread in the scheduling that's ready to run when the epoch starts has a chance to run. And this makes the scheduler really easy to model. The accounting is really easy. There was no need to measure weird things. All I'm doing is decrementing account till it gets to zero and then resetting it periodically. So this can be done in a one. And I can also use this interleaving idea, uh, right? So what I can do is, rather than moving straight down, so for example, it's possible that I want to give a thread a chance, to, uh, a low priority thread, a chance to not only run at the bottom, but to run periodically throughout the epoch. So uh, what, what, this is sort of a new version of the scheduler. There's a one here. There's a zero here if I have a chance to run. And there's a one here if I don't. So remember, Linux priorities are backwards. Negative numbers are good. So you'll see that the thread with a nice value of negative 20, which is the highest priority, can run in every epoch. The thread with the nice value of 19 is the lowest, can only run in the final epoch. But these other threads, they don't just run at the back. They run periodically throughout the, throughout the epoch. So this allows me to, it, it's a, it maintains the exact same properties of the scheduler, but it means I don't have to wait until the very, very end of the epoch to run low priority threads. For example, you'll see that the nice 15 thread can run here, 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 and here. Does this make sense? That's just a little minor variation that reduces latency a little bit more. So this is um, a nice description of what's good about this. And, and he points out something that we, we noticed earlier, which is that a lot of schedulers end up inadvertently penalizing interactive threads because they only run for short periods of time. And so by the time the scheduler sort of reruns them, a bunch of other threads have had a chance to run and used a lot more CPU time. And then you end up trying to, as he puts it, bonus them back through this weird interactivity detection. And this design does not suffer from that problem. OK, so now sort of the sad part of the story. Um, you know, remember, the, so part of the problem here was that the desktop community didn't have benchmarks and well-defined goals. So we came up with this nice idea, but it was very difficult to actually show somebody sort of a, uh, you know, a real convincing proof that this was good. People liked it. They felt they reported good performance on their machines, but there wasn't something easy to measure where you could say, this is really, really good. Um, this was popular with users, but it never left his private Linux kernel tree. Um, around the same time, so Ingo Molnar is the, uh, was the maintainer of the uh, 2.6 Linux scheduler. He, was the, he's the, he may still be, he probably still is, the maintainer of the Linux subsystem. So he's like, oh, by the way, maybe it would be a good idea for me to implement my own new scheduling algorithm right around the same time. Uh, he came up with something called the completely fair scheduler um, that was somewhat based on these, some of the same ideas. And at some point, Conclevis got very frustrated and said, see ya, I don't want to be a part of Linux anymore. I'm tired of doing all this work, and then I can't get my patches into the mainline. One really interesting point that, that Khan made, which I think is, is actually really, really a, a useful uh, design feature, was that he said, is it, does it really make sense for Linux to have a single scheduler? Linux is this big community. It runs on a bunch of different types of devices. Wouldn't it be more appropriate for us to have an architecture where the scheduler was something that the user could configure at runtime? And there are other parts of Linux that are actually done this way. So for example, the the uh, code that chooses the CPU frequency to run, there are algorithms that you can change on your machine uh, dynamically at, at runtime, and different communities use different algorithms. So for example, Android has their own algorithm that runs on their phones that they wrote, and they think does a better job than whatever Linux already had. So Kaliva's proposed this sort of pluggable scheduler architecture. Maybe this has happened, I don't know, I haven't ch checked recently, but it seems like kind of an obvious idea. All right, so what's the, I mean, to the degree there's a moral to the story, 
Uh, I think it's, you know, work on something that you find enjoyable, um, get really good at it, and if you have good ideas, so you might say, well, you know, this sounds like a failure, these ideas never made it to Linux, but you could also argue that this conversation and the focus on interactivity really helped shape the design of the Linux schedulers that are there. And this was an important, so I think Conclevis has made some, clearly made some important contributions, despite the fact that he may not have any code in the Linux mainline. So after a couple of years, uh, <laughs> so this is the part of the talk where, you know, that's, that's, uh, it's not G-rated anymore. Um, so a couple of years later, Clevis returned to the Linux community with a schedule that he referred to as the brain fuck scheduler. Um, this is a scheduler that, as he put it, was designed to be forward-looking only. This was something that was kind of designed for uh, more like devices like phones and maybe embedded devices. It's desktop oriented, has really low latencies, rigid fairness, nice prior description, and extreme scalability within normal load levels. Explaining the name, um, he said, this is a scheduler that tries to sort of reinvent things, throws out a lot of what we think we know. It's ridiculously simple. It performs really well, despite being so simple. It's, now here he's sort of, you know, he's throwing up the white flag. He said, there's no way this will ever get into mainline Linux, and I don't care. So I just decided to write something that I'm almost positive will never get into mainline Linux, and that way I don't have to worry about it. Right? I don't lie awake at night thinking, is Linus going to accept my patches? Right? I know he's not, because I wrote it in a way that he wouldn't like. Um, it's designed to sort of draw attention to the problems within the current scheduling uh, algorithms. It design, shows that we need a pluggable scheduler architecture. You can do a lot better with a scheduler designed for a specific purpose. It means that better CPUs mean lower latencies. This is an aspect of, of BFS. And this is my favorite reason, which is I must be crazy for, these are quotes, by the way. I didn't write these. I just want to point that out. Um, this, is, this is Khan Kalibas in his own words. Um, this was his description of how he felt about rejoining Linux. Um, all right, so I hope you guys have a great weekend. On Monday, we will talk about virtual memory. <laughs>